It's still Rosh Chodesh Iyar, so on Aleph Iyar is the yard site of Ravar and Lichtenstein, and uh, this week we're reading Parshat Kedoshim, and Kedusha was something which he had an incredible interest in. One of the books that was published after he passed away was something that he had worked on himself. He had taken, it was the only time he had taken a quote-unquote sabbatical, was to work on this book, which was a book which is called Kedushat Aviv. The reason he called it Aviv is that his name is Aaron, Aaron ben Yechiel, and Bluma. So it has his parents' name in the book, Aviv. And uh, it's a book which is, for the most part, halacha, and it deals with various aspects of Kedusha in his analysis. So therefore, on his yard side, it really is most appropriate to be talking about Kedusha, because this is something which, as I said, was uh, an absolute interest of his. And uh, somebody wants to... uh, actually enter into his thought and to learn his, you know, approach to learning. This is, uh, it's not the easiest, it's a book which is, you know, a serious book of a halachic Talmudic analysis, but it's one which is worthwhile and, uh, in my opinion at least, is accessible. If anybody buys it and it's not accessible, so then uh, I take no responsibility. But I think it, and it looks good on the shelf, just in case... uh, it, it proves to be too difficult, but I, I don't think that it is. Okay, so let us begin. So we have this new idea, which is really not a new idea, but it becomes a central idea, and that idea is to be Kadosh. Of course we can pose the question, how is it even possible for humans, for people to have Kedusha. So maybe that's asked and answered here. Kedoshim to you, why or how even? Ki Kedosh, ani Hashem alokeichem. That Kedusha is something which is results from the relationship which we have with God, or it's only by somehow fulfilling that relationship which allows Kedusha. But there is somewhat of a problem, and that would be what is our working definition of Kedusha. So those who may have learned this "Quote unquote sugya" in the past, we'll know that there's a machloket between Rashi and the Ramban. The Ramban looks very much in the previous section, and and essentially, I'll put it like this: According to Rashi, there is this commandment to be separate, kedushin to you, prushin to you, to separate from sin. And on the other hand, the Ramban would see it as more of a global idea, essentially, aside from the 612 other commandments, Kadoshim to you is how to go about being Kadosh, which means the Ramban, very famously, tells us that you can have something which he labels a Minuval B'Rishut Torah, where somebody essentially does the the checklist of all of the mitzvot, but he doesn't do them in a way of achieving Kedusha. So therefore, Kedusha is, for the Ramban, the objective and therefore it becomes something which is independent and something which then colors every other mitzvah, which means, okay, I did it. Now, did I do it in a kadosh way, or did I somehow do the almost impossible, which unfortunately people of all religions are able to succeed in doing, and that is doing something which they believe to be pious, but the way that they go about results in something which is other than piety. That's the beginning of the the parsha. Now, if we were to pay attention, we would see a couple of things. One is that there is somewhat of a similarity between Parshat Kedoshim and Parshat Mishpatim, and both of them have this other commonality, and that is that they remind us to some extent of the uh, Seretat Ibrot, which means there is this sense over here. Again, we go to the next passage, still in Source 1, Yishimova, Vivti Rov, Ed Shaptotai Tishmar, Ni Hashem. Yes, kind of reminds us of a couple of the Aserita uh, Dibrod, of Shabbat on the one hand and uh, dealing with parents on the other hand. I say dealing, not in a disrespectful way. I just didn't want to get into the issue of the Tira'u versus the Kibud. But there is this... It, it seems to be that the Aserita Dibrod in the background, and I'll say the same thing again, you get that sense in Parshat Mishpatim. Now, once I compare with Mishpatim, something else hopefully will become a little bit clearer, and that is, I could imagine that Kedusha is only the kinds of things where the nature is that it's spiritual by definition. So then maybe anything, especially in Vayikra, anything which is Mishkan-centric, anything which is has to do with the, the Mishkan, the, Mish, the, the Beit HaMikdash, the Korbanot, or I'll put it differently, anything which is ritual, there, therefore that would be the kinds of things which is a Kedusha, and therefore all of Sefer Vayikra would be a book of Kedusha, 
and therefore we had all kinds of examples till this point, and now there's just more Kedusha. But th- there's something else which emerges right away, and instead of going straight to the Pesukim, I want to use the Midrash, which clearly understands that which I want to say, or I'm going to explain that which the Midrash says. Kedoshim to you, in source to Vekor it quotes, and it goes, that's the Pasuk, Vayigba Hashem Tzvakot Bamishpat that God is somehow going to be elevated by us going about and creating justice. Which means it's not just in the Beit HaMikdash and the ritual per se, it's also going to be, and I'm going to say this in two different ways, one in the judicial system, or I'll say it a little differently, or the interaction between a person and their fellow, which means that the Ben Adam Lechavero and not just the Ben Adam Lemakom. And I hope that that then creates the clarity that Ben Adam Lechavero is very different from Ben Adam Lemakom. Again, very different. They, they seem to be completely different realms. And I could have imagined that Kedusha is only the things when I get involved in a Ben Adam Lemakom relationship, when I'm doing things connected to God. But over here, right away, the, this Midrash says, oh, what does Kedoshim you mean? That is, Vayikba Hashem, Tzavakot Bamishpat. How do you elevate God? And that's really interesting that that's what it quotes. And it continues, Tanya, Amar of Shimon ben Yochai, Eimatai Shmosh L'Kodesh Baruch which itself is a really interesting turn of phrase. When is God's name, who mitgadal ba'olamo, when is it, or when is it, again, made greater in this world, Bishasha Osem Midat Hadin, Birishaim, when wicked people are treated for their wickedness. And it says similarly in Yecheskel, By the way, that should remind you all of something. Think back to what Shem Yechai just now told us. So I could have thought that, sorry, I could have thought that, oh no, only in ritual, only when I'm saying the Kaddish, and say, no, no, there's another way of making God's name great as it was, and it says, and that is creating a world where there's a world of justice. So this Midrash, again, it may seem like there's some kind of a disconnect. Kadoshim Tiyu should be only things of ritual, but the Midrash knows something. And it knows, as I said, what we all could have or should have figured out ourselves. And that is, you go a couple verses down the line in Kadoshim, you look at source three, Lo Tignovu. Again, this is the context of Kadusha. Lo Tignovu, Lo Tichachashu, Lo Tishakru Ishbamito. These are all ways of taking someone else's possessions. By taking things, denying that you found it, lying in court, by the way, that goes back to Shem Hashem, Shem HaGadol, that's the relationship there, or the interrelationship between the action of stealing and between the desecration of God's name. Vichilalta et Shem Hashem Elokach, and that becomes so interesting because we were just now introduced to a new concept, and that is Chilul Hashem. And, and by the way, here in a, mo- in a most literal sense, what makes it Chilul Hashem, you swore in God's name to lie. What was the context of the of the swearing? Most likely it's, the, it's commenting on the previous verse, and that is that you went and you acted in an unjust way in terms of the rules of justice. So now you go back to that Midrash that talked about, well, what exactly Kedoshim to you is that's creating justice. Where did that come from? Well, by simply reading the verses as you continue. If we'll go on to Pasuk Tetvav, again, it's still in Source 3. Lo tasu avu ba mishpat, lo tisa pene dal, lo tar pene gadol, but tzedek tishpura mitacha. So again, it's talking about over here of doing justice in a just way and making sure that there, we're following not just to get to the right conclusion, but we're actually also finding we're also following the proper procedure in order to get there. We're not going to elevate somebody simply because they're weaker and we're not going to punish somebody. We're not maybe going to help somebody because they're stronger. We're not going to do, we're going to do justice. Um, Again, the continuation of this concept of Kedusha, which are all kinds of laws that we would have said are very nice laws, very fine laws, and maybe they would not have been the first thing we would have chosen when we're thinking about contemplating what exactly is Kedusha 
So now we have the Torah's understanding of what is Kedusha. What does this Parsha lead us into? And that is one of the chapters. Again, there's more in that, but that represents one of the chapters in this Parsha, Perak Yutet. When we move over to Perak Kaf, we find still there's going to be something which is going to connect it, and you're going to see what it is in a moment. Over here, right away, it talks about something which is called Molach. Now, Molach is interesting, because Molach, as far as we understand it, is killing children in order to serve, to do some kind of ritual, which is an absolute, again, just think about this for a second, in, in terms of the Ben Adam the Chavero is literally sacrificed because of the Ben Adam the Makom, right? That's what Molach is, and it says over here, so that concept of Chilil Hashem is right here as well. But not only that, it also says that this is going to desecrate the holy places. So therefore, this is the opposite of something which is holiness. And, and, and in a sense, in a metaphor, it, I'm going to say it again, because I think you all heard as I said it, it really is interesting that I can't divorce the ritual from the interpersonal, but over here, if I'm trying to sacrifice the interpersonal, literally, in order to create the ritual, then something is really wrong, and that is the Chilul Hashem, and obviously not a uh, Kiddush Hashem. It also uses an interesting term along the way, a, a term which I started last week, didn't get as far as we really should have, but it says, V'hikarti oto ve'et V'hikrati oto, from the word karet, ve'et kol hazonim acharov levznot acharei molach mikarev ha'am. So it's really interesting, it uses the word znut over here. We're going to see in a moment when a midrash is going to pick up on some of this part as well. A couple verses later, also staying away from idolatry, and then it says, v'hit kadash tem v'yitem kedoshim ki yeni Hashem alkeichem. So that really is the continuation of kedoshim to you. Right? As I said, we're in the same parasha, we've moved up a chapter, but it's still it's, it's focused on the same thing. Why or how? So again, how does the kedusha take place? God infuses us with us. Then it goes into a list. Kilel domavbo. Again, echoing some of the asserts you wrote in terms of honoring the parents. The ish asher yin afet eshet ish asher yin afet eshet reyo motimato no efa no afet, and then it goes into a whole list of what we call the arayot again, which is something you should say <laughs> is in that seret that he wrote. Here you have a whole list, and then we have the conclusion. Vivdaltem bein abehimah torah lo tmei al bein ofa tmei lo tahor, which really is a wrap up of a good part of vayikra, because that was all the way back in Parshat Shmini. And we'll skip a little more. V'yitem li kedoshim ki kadosh ani Hashem. V'avdil etchem ina amim liot li. Again, following up this other theme that we had seen of not following the practices of uh, of others. That again really takes us towards the end of Vay- of kedoshim. If we will sneak and take a peek into next week's parsha, we have the same kind of words or concepts or themes returning and coming at us. In source five, Kedoshim Yulah Elohim, Velo Yichalu Shem Elohim. Again, same words. Be Kadosh and don't create this Chilul uh, Hashem. Again, in a much very literal sense. And over here, it's talking about the requirements of the Kohen, how a Kohen is somebody who's deserving to be one who works in the Mishkan or the Mikdash. But then it goes back to that word that we noticed right before. So again, it creates the Nitzvik Tusha, and over here it uses the word Zona, here in the most literal sense, unlike the old, the other times it was used. Again, the same idea. Again, going to this theme of what is Kedusha, what is Chilul, that people need to have Kedusha, how is Kedusha possible, it's only possible because Hashem gives and, or commands or allows there to be Kedusha in the world. Following up a little bit further, that was in Parshat Emma, Perak Kafala, following a little further in Perak Kafbet, we again find similar themes 
God speaks, the Bela Ron Vanov Yigzu Vinazrumi Kotche Bene Sro Veloy Khalu Shem Kotchi Asher Himikadishim Li Ani Hashem. Again, rules of engagement create a kiddush Hashem and don't allow a, kid, a, a chilul Hashem. Um, again, these words are going to come out again and again on these themes or these phrases again and again. And we'll just want to move towards the end. Which, by the way, is really the verse that the Gemara is going to use about the obligation of Kiddush Hashem on the one hand and the prohibition of Chilul Hashem on the other hand. So really what I'm pointing at is that when it started with this, Kedoshim Tiyu Ki Kedoshani Hashem Elokeichem, it wasn't a one verse. And, and in, in a certain sense, I'm really ignoring the whole Ramban versus Rashi technicality about what that word means, because I'm much more interested in, thematically in what emphasis it's putting on going through Parshat Kedoshim, going through Parshat Emor, about this obligation of creating Kedusha, about avoiding Chilul Hashem, about trying to infuse different areas of life with Kedusha. We saw one example taking us towards the whole concept of Mishpatim is a part of it, and there is this other element that I want to note as well. In, uh, in source number eight, Again, just interesting how these things come together. And also, just by the way, anybody learning Mishnah Yomi, they would be get up to this in the last day or so, or maybe even today. I don't recall exactly. I'm never on the exact days that everyone else is. This talks about the Mishnah in Sota, and it says that when the Sota, again, is somebody who is guilty of, possibly guilty of Znut, or suspected of Znut. So you have this idea of Kedusha and Znut, but listen to one of the things that it says in the Mishnah. And she gets threatened. Letting people know about severity of their actions, consequences, and so on. Why has... Causes lots of trouble. Her base choko say, and levity causes lots of trouble. Her base yalduto say, immaturity can cause a lot of trouble. Her base shchini marimo say, and bad neighbors can cause lots of trouble. Ase laman shmo hagadol shenuchtav biktusha shlo yimache alam. Al-hamayim. So this is trying to avoid most literally a chilul Hashem because you're going to write God's name on this parchment which will then be destroyed and it gives this warning, you know what, if you're guilty then just admit guilt in order to avoid God's name being destroyed. That's a, again, it's not chilul Hashem and rather create, allow there to be at least a little more Kedusha. Maybe you sacrificed the Kedusha in your marriage, but don't cause there to be, again, literally, a Chilul Hashem. So it's interesting how all of the various aspects come together over here. In, in source number nine, which is a little long, we'll see how much of it we have, or you have the patience to go through it. It's another Midrash, this time a Midrash in Tanchuma, and it starts to tell us, about various understandings of what is the idea of Kedusha. The Brahman is your Kedoshim to you. And it says, The same thing. God can be lifted by creating justice. And you realize I'm skipping a little bit. And then start quoting verse after verse. Now that's really interesting because that is what's going to allow us to coronate God, as it were is that there being justice in the world allows God, who is the God of justice, to be elevated. Melech Yosheh Vakisei Din. That, again, it's something which we're really used to as a Rosh Hashanah theme, but it's saying is that justice in the world is what coronates God. So it's not just that, you know, on Rosh Hashanah, we coronate God who's going to sit in judgment of us, but it's when we are partners with God and create justice in the world, then God gets elevated and God gets coronated. Which is again really interesting as a background. And so on we'll quote. And yeah, and then it also goes that somehow we do this and it causes God to be sitting on the throne. And he says, Yeah, that's really the case. And then it quotes a Pasuk which out of left field, So yeah, we recognize the verse. It's easier for us than some of the other ones. It's out of left field in terms of God sitting in justice. 
Although you can say something else happened right then, that God sat in justice and the nations of the world who were guilty were punished for the guilt of that particular moment. But it's interesting that this whole thing is about God sitting on his throne, the Midah of Din, and all of this has to do with Kedusha. That's the starting point. That's Kedoshim to you, and we need to create a world where there is justice. Just we'll go a little bit more, a little down. It says, Mihain Elu Kisaot, Beit David, Vizikna Israel. So therefore, there now seems to be this parallel that God gets coronated and sits on the throne by virtue of justice in the world, but who goes about creating this? And again, this is really where you can say a leap just now took place. Oh, that's what Malchut Beit David is. Malchut Beit David is not just that we need a king to be a nation like every other nation. No, that we need a king in order to in order to create a country that lives by justice and creates justice in the entire region, and for that matter, in the entire world. And that's Malchut Beit David. Um, and as it says, Kisaot le Beit David, which you now realize that there's a parallel over here. What is Kedusha when God sits in judgment? What is Kedusha? It's actually Malchut Beit David. Malchut Beit David is going to be the manifestation down here below of kingship, which will then bring about the judgment which the king who's coronated above wants to take place on this world, which really then creates this whole nother, maybe even you can say a macro level of Kedusha, Kedoshim Tiyu, and okay, Kedoshim Tiyu, you know, I would have thought, okay, do a mitzvah in a, in a holy way, and over here is talking about something which is much, much broader than that. It's really the need for Malchut Beit David in order to allow God to be coronated because there is justice in the in the world, which really then again, does take the Ten Commandments, take the Aserat Tibrod, take the, the laws, the values that God gave us, how are they going to be manifest throughout the world? That becomes the challenge, and Malchut Beit David is going to be one of the solutions. Um, continue a little bit more, and I know I'm skipping a little bit, but still I'm in this source, source at the end of this Medrash Ten Chuma. God gets elevated, coronated, lifted up, in uh, with justice, it says, But hold on a second, it's not just justice, there's also other things. That's really interesting. Just think back about that midrash. Maseya dai tavu bayam. So over here it's a pasuk in Yeshayahu. Ki brato yiladav maseya dai bekirbo yakdishu shemi. So again, it's, it goes back to this theme. So it's interesting because really there are two different levels of taking us back to the sea, and that but it's very deliberate. V'chein hu omer Yisrael asher b'cha et pa'er v'atem mitkadshim bi v'ani mitkadesh b'chem. And that's what it means, v'tgadashtem v'yitem kedoshim. So this whole thing is talking about this interrelationship between God and man, that we allow God to be elevated and holy as it were, because of course God doesn't need us, but therefore we reveal God to this world and therefore allow God to be elevated in man's minds, in man's consciousness and in man's actions, hopefully. And as we do that, we become elevated and we become kadosh. And therefore, there's this wonderful interrelationship. And therefore, that you know that little verse that we started with, kadoshim tiyu, kadoshim ni, Hashem elokeichem, as I said, it's not just isolated. It goes on through this whole chapter and the next chapter and the next chapter and the next chapter. And to a very great extent, it's something which is going to be here with us in as we continue in uh, Vayikra. Here's another Midrash, which again starts from the beginning. Kedoshim, Kedoshim to you. And it notes something, which you can look it up, it's correct. It's Chaser. The, the Kedoshim doesn't have the Vav. It's not Kadosh with the Vav, it's Chaser. Chaser Vav. V'lam necha she'im yilech adim b'derkei bor'o Kadosh yomar lo. The Vav is always a connection. right? The letter Vav, remember the Vavim in the Mishkan? The Vav is a connection. Right? Whenever you have love in a world, in the beginning of a word, the end of a word, it connects to something. So it says over here, Kadosh is written in a uh, deficient way. And to say that if you're doing what you're doing in order to be connected to God, again, then there's Kadusha. And now it doesn't say Kadosh, it says Kadesh. Now, the same three letters. Now, what exactly does the word mean over here? 
liyad shel isha k'dei listakel ba lo yinakeh b'dino shel gehinom. Because a man who goes over to a woman to get, get changed, essentially saying is that this man is doing this for lustful reasons. Shenemar yad liyad lo yinakeh ra. Uminayin shev pasuk hu midaber bizona. So now, again, I, I, I'm sure you weren't, you knew I was going to come back to it. You just didn't know where or how. Now, again, you, you could be saying, what just now happened over here? And maybe this will work much better with the Ramban of Kedoshim to you, we need to do things. So it's not just performance. Judaism is never about performance. It's about motivation, and it's about attitude, and it's about transformation. Which means two people could be doing the same two things, and it doesn't mean that both of them are getting to the same objective. And over here, it's talking about the objective, which means the kadoshim to you right now it's without the vav, and you need to bring the vav into it. You need to have the god consciousness as you're doing what you're doing. Otherwise, what you may end up finding is that instead of having kedusha, you have something which is very, very different or separate or the opposite from kedusha. And in order to understand this a little bit better, because maybe it wasn't as clear, if you look in, in Source 11, Lo tia kdesha mi b'nai Yisrael, v'lo yia kadesh mi b'nai Yisrael, lo tvi etnan zona u mechir kelev beit Hashem alokecha, v'chol neder ki tovat Hashem alokecha gam shneim. Which means, I can't, I want to work backwards, I can't then say, or a woman, let's say, works as a prostitute, can't say, listen, Bottom line is, I made some money, and now I'm going to go and bring a Corbin with the money. He says, no, it doesn't work that way. God says, that's not that's not Kedoshim to you. That's not the holiness that, that I want. That's not something which is acceptable. And again, along the way over here, it used the words Kedesha and Kadesh, which are, in a sense, the opposite of Kedusha. So that's really interesting, but it was going back to say, yeah, what's the difference? The difference is the Vav or not the Vav. Kadesha or Kadesh is not the same thing as Kadosh, because in order to be Kadosh, there needs to be some kind of a connection to God, which means even Kadushan. Kadushan is, Ariat Mokadesh Ali, Kadat Moshe of Yisrael. There needs to be something which is done with Kadusha, not something which is done where there is, it is devoid of Kadusha. There is a Sifri. The Sifri is the Medrash HaLachayim Bamidbar. And in a certain sense, this is what got me started to think about this whole topic today. It says, V'yom HaShem HaMosheh, Chamisha Asar Pam, Didaber Emosheh, Biyom Echad. God spoke to Moshe 15 times in one day. You know, in the Gemara, it tells us that the, the, the greatest day in Gemara history is the Bo Bayom. That was the Yom, the day that they took away the guards, the day that Rabbi Gamliel was disposed, the day that Rav Lezab and Azariah took over. That was the day that everybody was involved in discussions. And the Gemara tells us that the Mesechet Ediot was, was discussed on that day, and all kinds of things were resolved on that day, and every question that there was, everything was resolved. That is the day. So over here, this major saying, yeah, there's a day, there's, there is a major day in the Chumash. Now, we know about this because we've learned before, but we did not realize it really goes this far. Which day am I talking about? So just to make sure that we understand, which one? <clears throat> the day the Mishkan was consecrated, which is one month ago. It's on Rosh Chodesh. Nisan, that is the day that was mentioned in the Shemot, the day in Vayikra, the day was mentioned by Midbar. But now, pay attention, it's going to tell you all kinds of things, 15 things. There's no place, Rashi does not quote this Midrash, I believe. Rashi quotes that there were 10 Nitiot. The Elohim, Adun Kiya Kriv Mikem Korban, took us to the beginning of Vayikra. Tzavet Aron, Parsha Tzav. Kachlacha Egel, that took us to the beginning of Shemini. By the way, you notice, Parsha after Parsha. Yain v'shecher altesh, that's the continuation of Shemini. Ish ish mi beit Yisrael asher yishchat kemase eretz Mitzrayim. Um, those are parshio which are, again, subsequent to Shemini. We have their achrimot, kedoshim tiyu. Now we're in Parsha Kedoshim. Which means when it said, when, when Parsha Kedoshim began, where it says, Daber kol adam b'nei Yisrael martin kedoshim tiyu, that's what Moshe was to go and gather them. But what, when did God say this to Moshe? So this is telling us that this is that same day God told him that as well. What are we up to? Emor el koanim. V'yishlechu min ha-machaneh. That is a little bit earlier. Um, sorry. V'yishlechu min ha-machaneh is actually in Bamidbar. Kol tivarchu. 
That's also in in, in Bamidbar. Kach mi itam nasi achad liyom. That's in again parshat naso. Bahalotcha. That's still in Bamidbar. Kach et levim. That's in Bahalotcha. Vichulecha para aduma. That's parshat chukat in Bamidbar. Vayom Hashem Moshe nasi achad liyom. That is in Bahalotcha nasi achad liyom. Which means these are all these sections. Again, when we read them, by Devar Hashem Moshe Leima, right? It just sounds kind of like. That's the way that the Torah talks. It says, no, here are 15 different things, which according to this, Rosh are all taught on that day. For, for, again, for my interest, I think the one that we did not know, or even to think to imagine, is that Kedoshim was taught on that day. And, and that itself is interesting, because you could have argued that a lot of these things are really discussing the man-to-God relationship, and over here we have something which is an interpersonal relationship as well with this act of, a, a aspect of Mishkan and so on. This is a day the Mishkan is created. So you would say, okay, what purpose is the Mishkan created? The Mishkan is created for Mishkan work. So that's why it's really interesting, especially the way that we know in the beginning that there, there is this aspect of the interpersonal, this aspect of the Mishkan, and therefore I can't think or I can't imagine creating a holy world if that holiness does not affect the world itself. If it's only in some closed building and the only way that you do ritual is where holiness is, and that's what really makes this addition that Parsha Kedoshim is mentioned over here as well. Now, just to continue with this a little bit, because now it's going to connect to one of these other things, it's going to say over here, Yom HaShem Moshe, Nasiyah Chad Yom, that was said as well. Now, there were 12 Nasiyim and then 12 days, this is from Rosh Chodesh, going on for the next 12 days, one Nasi each day is going to bring the offering. So when God said, Nasiyah Chad, Omer Lehem Moshe, L'Kulchem Nemar Li, Shetikrivu, Avo Lo Nemar Li, Mimi Kem Yakriv Rishon. No one knows who should go first. Now going back to this idea of Kiddush Hashem. By the way, now you realize why Parshat Kedoshim is part of this discussion is because we've been talking about from Kedoshim going through Emor, this idea of this, of this Kiddush Hashem or the Chilul Hashem. Have you sanctified God's name? Have you desecrated God's name? Now we're talking about something or someone who's going to be helping to go about to celebrate the creation of the Mishkan says, who should we do this? The person who actually operated outside of the Mishkan, Ze Kidesh Moshe Kaddish Baruch Hu Al Hayam. Now right now, when you notice that it's Al Hayam, this should then connect it with all those references that we noticed before about what's the Yam doing here? How, why in the world are we talking about the Yam? So yeah, you could have said, yeah, on the Yam is where Mishpat took place, but now you realize that it's a little bit more interesting because it's also the one who, you know, the spark plug who starts the whole thing off of going through the Yam, that is Nachshon. V'hu ra'uy lahorid ha And he's the one who's worthy to, to bring down the Shechina. V'hu mikem yakriv rishon, l'kaf nemar makriv yom rishon, Nachshon, b'kulam k'tiv korbano, u'bo k'tiv v'kiravnu b'kulam amru atidim chaserbo, and so on. Here it does the atidim. I didn't need source 13, but I'm just going to tease it out of what he said. I could have asked it anyway, but he added one thing to this, which I liked. Tole Yaakov Yosef, of course, if you don't know, was one of the major students of the Besht, the Baal Shem Tov. Over here it says, I'm a Moshe Yisrael Kodesh Baruch, I'm a Marli Shetakrivu, Avolo Nemarli Mimikim Yekrivu Chemnat, Nu Enem Benach Shon Mishifte Yehuda. So it just added one more aspect in, not just Nachshon, Nachshon from Yehuda. By the way, that just helped us with something else, because in the very beginning, when we were talking about God's kingship and us enthroning God, and then Malchut Beit David has a purpose. So now you realize that this whole thing is so much more interesting because Nachshon becomes a, an essential part of all of this. And Nachshon, of course, is from Yehuda, and therefore by the tribe of Yehuda. Now, whether David Amelech is literally from Nachshon or not is something we could uh, discuss. The whole genealogy is more complicated than I could deal with. But it is nonetheless interesting over here that he focuses specifically on Yehuda. Now, the other thing about Yehuda is, is over here it focuses specifically on Shekidesh, right, Al Hayam. But we also know that with Yehuda himself, there's this other aspect. And that is, is that when uh, his sons do whatever they do, which, by the way, I'm willing to even consider to be somewhat akin to Molach, but they do whatever it is that they do. And then he does not allow his third son to marry Tamar. 
And when she finally comes and, well, she realizes he's coming and then she dresses up as a zona. So that was also one of the themes that we've seen along the way. But the other is that the only other time in the Torah that the word Kadesh is used other than we had seen in over there, not to be Lotia Kadesh and Yisrael, is that when he goes looking for this woman that he treated as a zona, and he sends a message in Pasuk HaFalif, by the way, I love that. Instead of Ayei Makom Kivodo, right, look, looking for holiness, Ayei HaKadesha. And uh, they tell him, There wasn't over here. And uh, then Yehuda stands as a judge when he finds out that she's pregnant and says, take her out to be killed. And this is, of course, the opposite of Mishpat, which is the, which is pretty much where everything stands. And now we will read a Tosefta at the very end, then by a Keriuda, a Yomatzat Kami Menu, which goes back to Tzedaka and Tzedek and Mishpat. But let's first read a Tosefta, as you see, a long Tosefta in Brachot, and then we'll try to put this all together. The The earlier part of this Tosefta is, it tells us that Rabbi Nutarifon was involved in teaching, and that's really where this is coming from, so I'm just going to, I don't want to do the whole thing because you see this enough afterwards. So that's our starting point Tosefta. So what did you do that he goes first? By the way, you do realize now there's two different possibilities. Okay, but if you don't realize it yet, as, as of right now, why does he go first? Because he admitted, which, which is really interesting, because Yehuda was hodem, was modem. Yehuda becomes Yehuda when he admits. So notice the play in words over there, because that's really interesting. There were rabbis sitting there in the outside I know, I know there are people who pronounce it not as Teman, as Timani, but we have a Temani daughter-in-law, so this is Hatemani. They were involved in the teaching of Rabbi Kiva. Okay, back, continuation of our same question. That's what Rabbi Tarfun had said. Right, they said, let's continue. What are you talking about? How can you say, because he admitted, he admitted after doing horrific things, this meaning not going further down the rabbit hole of terrible behavior should not be the reason why he becomes the Melech. Because he saved his brother from being killed. How, how that? By the way, this is also not wonderful. Because he did not agree to kill Yosef and only to sell him. You do realize this is not the best. Yeah. Are you kidding? That sh- and, and best, that's going to help for his guilt in terms of the Mechira itself. So he didn't do something worse? Come on. Because he was very modest. He says, I'll take this place. So he's saying, okay, being somebody modest is something which will help in terms of being in this, to get to a position of Malchut. We're going to skip a little bit. He was an Arev. Of course he had to take his place. He said, he said to Yaakov that I take responsibility for silver shall arrive. Let's say that the day Aravuto. When you sign that you're going to be an Arev for somebody, how do you say that in English, Arev? A guarantor. You, you, sign, you sign on the Mashkanta that you're going to pay someone's Mashkanta. So don't be surprised when they knock on your door and they take over your bank account. That's what you signed up for. You notice it's not satisfied yet. So now it goes back to that phrase we were looking for, for the Kiddush Hashem. Because what's the whole point of Malchud is to create a Kiddush Hashem. What's the whole point of Malchud is to be the earthly manifestation of God's Malchud in order to create this wonderful connection. So it had to, of course, be a Kiddush Hashem. Because Notice, Shifto Yehuda, instead of just Nachshon, Shifto Yehuda, V'yerad Chile, V'kidesh Shmo Shel Makom Al 
Hayam. They're the ones who helped create the Kiddush Hashem. And by the way, again, that the Mishpat takes place and the, and the wicked are punished. And so on. Hopefully everybody read this this morning. So therefore, this idea of the of the malchut is actually the same idea. Again, I'm repeating myself. The same idea of creating the kiddush Hashem. So I, I just want to go back and make sure that we see the the line and see the connection over here. Essentially, we have this obligation of. Kedusha, which, which by itself is a wonderful obligation. We, we need to be holy. And as I said from the very beginning, you know, we have this argument between Rashi and the Ramban, what exactly does it mean to become holy? So it's interesting to me that if you start reading further, you realize that it's not an isolated, it's not a one-time usage. It's something rather which then creates the theme moving forward. There needs to be Kedusha. We also learn along the way that Kedusha is the opposite of of Chilul Hashem. We also learned along the way that there were a number of references to Znut on the one hand, or this idea of Kteisha, where there is similar to Kteisha, but there's lacking the God consciousness or the God connection, and therefore it ends up creating something which is very, very different from actual Kteisha. We see in this, uh, in that long uh, Tosefta, we see this this debate which takes place, what was it about Yehuda where, whereby Yehuda ends up being the first? Now, one of the reasons, I have to make sure we understand this, one of the reasons why this is significant, it's one of the 15 things that happened on that day, which means there is a direct connection between Kedoshim to you and that the Nisim start their offerings on that day and specifically Yehuda is on that day. So essentially for me, and I'm going to say it again, for me that was really the starting point by asking myself, hold on a second, Kedoshim Tiyu really seems to be the outlier among all the other things that are talked about because everything else really did seem to be so much more ritual-oriented as opposed to something which is something else independent, especially when you notice how the idea of Kedoshim is used specifically in the same chapter, but even further moving along in, in Vayikra. So then asking myself this question, so again, what does this mean that Kedoshim is creating Mishpat and so on? That's what leads us to Malchut, which means that's what seems to be the underlying message that this Midrash is trying to tell us. There were 15 things, Kedoshim to you is one. And again, I'm not going through every one of them because most of them are very easy. They're about the Mishkan. So who brought about the Kedusha of the Mishkan? Oh, that, that's, who brought out the Kedusha of the Mishkan? That's easy. That was Yehuda. Yehuda brings about the Mishkan. He's the one who brings down the Shekhinah. Which means if we never understood before, hold it, why is the role of Malchut David eventually to bring about the Beit HaMikdash as well? No, that, that goes back to Yehuda. That goes back to this concept of Kiddush Hashem. That goes back to this idea of creating justice on this world. It's not just something, you know, that Mashiach has this checklist, does this, this, and this. No, it's creating knowledge of God on this world. It's creating a Kiddush Hashem on this world. It's creating God consciousness on this world. There needs to be a change on this world. You know, one of the biggest corruptions theologically in the, in the history of the world was this idea of Christianity that you can have Mashiach but without the Messianic age. You know, no, you don't need that. All that will happen some other time. Wonderful. <laughs> okay, <laughs> until then. Which means how, Judy couldn't entertain the possibility of someone being Mashiach without doing what Mashiach needs to do. That's exactly the point. So if you hear tracing backwards, hold it. What's the origins of Yehuda? Where does all of this come from? And that's the other thing Christianity could not possibly imagine, the whole sordid history and background of Yehuda. But that doesn't indicate, that doesn't stop who Yehuda becomes. There does become Malchut. There does become this ability of creating this, uh, Kiddush Hashem, but Kiddush Hashem, so if you go back to that, ju- that trial of Tamar, that becomes very important because justice then takes place at the end of the day. She is the one who's not guilty. She's more innocent than he is. That becomes very important because that's part of what Kiddusha is, is creating a place of, uh, of holiness and I'm gonna, of justice. And I'll say it again. It could be that the various aspects of Yehuda's life 
which is, again, a really interesting background to Kedoshim to you. And all those various as- aspects may all be added up together in order to create Nachshon, in order to create that tribe, in order to create the consciousness of that tribe, that the tribe is the one who's going to jump in first, and they're the ones who going to be the day that the Shekhinah is going to come down. But as I said, the backdrop of all of this, I think, is much more interesting than we normally note. And in this case, what we really did is we looked at the various Midrashim and then try to understand how they are connected to the Psukim, even though the Psukim themselves needed to be paid attention to. And anybody who's going to give these long, and I'm sure lots of people will, these long and learned interpretations of what Kadoshim to you is and only focus on that Pasuk itself without looking at all of the other usage. And we don't look at all of them, by the way, there's more. To look at the other usage just moving forward, I think they kind of... Uh, miss the the mark. But as I said in the beginning, the Rav Lichtenstein was very interested in uh, in the concept of Kedusha and the idea of Kedusha and doing things with Kedusha and having a God consciousness and having a world which is just and having a world where there really is going to be a Kedush Hashem. So all of these things which I think very much interested him. For us, you know, everything we're learning this year is clouded and you know, by the war, but is also clarified by the war, and therefore going to war and defending our people and sometimes helping God create justice in the world, all of that is a Kiddush Hashem, an absolute Kiddush Hashem, and it's also something that we need to uh, be focused on and not to listen to various opinions of the world, proportionality, and so on and so forth. There is really a, a battle between good and evil. It's something that we uh, need to absolutely understand that the people involved in fighting and protecting are people who are involved in Kiddush Hashem and the Kadesh Shem Shemayim. God should protect all of them and part of, I think, the really important concept of Judaism, that we can have a concept of Kiddush Hashem without, unfortunately, having to die al Kiddush Hashem. You know, this uh, juxtaposition between Yom HaShoah on the one hand and Yom HaZikaron and Yom HaAtzmod on the other hand is something which is very jarring, and especially during the moments of silence when one thinks and contemplates all the Kiddush Hashem which has taken place, that we hope that we're able to lead lives of creating Kiddush Hashem while living vibrant, healthy, religious lives without doing uh, Kiddush Hashem in the, I'll say the old-fashioned way, in the way where a person sacrifices their life. We're looking to live our lives by Kiddush Hashem.